view, a biblical view, not the biblical view. We're talking about historical science. This happened in the past. We're going to interpret it, but we're going to interpret it through the lens of the scriptures. Okay? And uh, just for you that don't know, I, I <clears throat> spent 32 years as a public school teacher, a year and a half is in the Christian school teaching, and I taught two years of homeschool science to a homeschool group. So that's my science background. Um, my master's is actually in uh, physical education, but that's a lot of biology and that, learning about the human body and physiology of exercise and everything. So uh, I, I learned quite a bit. And then when I retired, I got the passion for creation science. And I started doing this. So dinosaurs existed in the past. We, we can't do anything in the laboratory that's observable and repeatable. So I'm going to give you an interpretation. Well, you know, what, what's behind my interpretation? My, my interpretation is going to be through God's word. And on this cartoon, you see that the no God guy says, your, your biblical creations are so biased when you look at evidence. You should try being more objective like me. So he's blind to the fact that he is biased. I admit my bias. My bias is determined by the scripture found in God's word. And his bias is de determined by secular humanism, the evolutionary dogma, and so on. So he's very biased also. We, we all have our biases. So... What's the difference between an evolutionist dinosaur and a creationist dinosaur? The one guy is thinking a product of millions of years of evolution. The other guy is saying created by God only 6,000 years ago. So only the points of view being used to interpret the dinosaur evidence is the difference. Where you're, where you're looking at it from. And that's what we have to remember as we go through this. Because we know that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So we want to stand on that. Oops, I went backwards, sorry. I'm going backwards again. Three, two, ten. Okay. So just a few scriptures to let you know firmly where my bias is coming from. In Romans it says, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. So someday I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to be telling him why I taught what I taught tonight. Uh, and and uh, I want to be able to say it, I did 100% what I thought your word was telling me to say, what your spirit was telling me to say as I prepared this. I don't want it to be anything else. And in John, Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how do you believe my words? So in Genesis is where we learn the concept of kinds. We learn about how old the earth is, that it was formed in seven literal days. Then Moses wrote that according to Jesus. And you see, he wrote about me. Genesis 3.15 tells you that even though Satan is going to cause this trouble, ultimately Jesus wins the battle. That's one of the first prophetic scriptures in the Bible. So if you don't believe Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? How, why would you believe the plan of salvation if you doubt what's in the Bible in the Old Testament? So Jesus is saying you've got to kind of take the whole Bible. You can't just pick and choose what, what you want to believe. And the, I believe that the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. Otherwise, I won't be here tonight. <laughs> and... In Psalm 86, it says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forevermore. I don't care what these so-called uh, wise and intelligent scientists call me because I believe in a young earth. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. And that's what I'm going to teach because I want to praise Jesus' name, not any scientist. And so that's where I'm coming from tonight. Now you know. And I believe that the Bible should uh, 
be what we guides us in our thinking in every area, including dinosaurs. And I am especially uh, gifted to be in this area, not gifted, but uh, this is uh, something that I'm especially good at simply because, yeah, we used to have fun on those old dinos. That's how old I am. <laughs> well, this is actually at the Creation Museum. Uh, my wife and I uh, volunteered there, uh, me for nine weeks or for six weeks while they're building it. And I got to sit on the dinosaur that you got to be under 10 to sit on now. So we got to hurry up and get you there. Okay. And we know that dinosaurs capture our attention. We fantasize about them. We just make all kinds of movies about them. We build bicycles with dinosaur shapes to them, all that kind of stuff. Well, in 2010, one of probably the highlight of my whole creation seeking time was when I went uh, with Dr. Rick Oliver of Confound the Wise Ministries. This is actually out in front of the Creation Museum. We took this picture of us uh, on that trip. And uh, he, he's, he's got, you can look him up, Rick Oliver, Confound the Wise Ministries, awesome creation speaker, lives in Tonto Basin. But uh, this, this is the guy who really helped me understand the secular view because he was a secular scientist for many years until he became the creationist that he is today. And we got to go there and see the dinosaurs at the Creation Museum. And I got to take a lot of pictures of them, and I'll be showing you a lot of those tonight. But we got to be aware of something, that we're not the only fishers of men, that the TV, the books, all are trying to get our kids. If your kid has read regular dinosaur books and they're, 10 years old, they probably heard millions of years way too many times. <laughs> it kind of gets ingrained. And guess what? I learned that once it gets ingrained, it's hard to remove. And uh, so we got, that's why I'm telling you guys, we got to be serious about getting these materials out to our churches, uh, getting them out to our grandkids or nieces and nephews, uh, because if they're especially in, their, in the public school, they're not going to hear this. And even the adults have things like this. Dinosaurs take wings. Yeah, they found out this was fraudulent. They retracted it with a little, this is a cover article, and they retracted it with a little bitty article. And, and the evolutionists themselves said, you can't do that. This was a big boo-boo. We got we to let everybody know about it, and they finally did. But a lot of times they'll do something like this and they'll, they'll try to hide the retraction and let, leave you believing that that happened when it didn't. Dennis the Menace asks a really good question here. If people weren't around when dinosaurs were, then who drew their pictures? Yeah. Good question. Well, we know that dinosaurs were around because they left behind some traces. These are the Paluxy Riverbed Dinosaur Tracks in Texas. And there's one famous track there. And I'm going to give you all the sources I have for this at the end. And if anybody wants to come up and take a picture of it with your phone or whatever, you can. But because uh, a lot of this information is real interesting, I'm just giving you a tip of the iceberg, really, tonight. Just some of the stuff that I have found and thought interesting. But on this site, that they have the human footprint covered by a dinosaur footprint. And, and they say they verified it by a spiral CT scan. So that was in 2000. Since then, some of those human footprints are starting to look more like baby dinosaur footprints. So they say, we've got way too much stuff to, to do anything questionable, so maybe we shouldn't mention that anymore. So just so you know that, because this is kind of a famous thing that for a long time, Christians cited this, but now we're not 100% sure. We want to be 100% sure. Uh, real quick. Yes. The previous, the previous yes. They're saying the Paluxy Riverbed is drying up because of the drought and that these footprints are being exposed. Well, they've been exposed like this for years. I mean, the, there's the river running in the background there, but it's not huge. The, only in the flood stage does it fill that whole thing. But you were right. It's in the news right now. Yeah. So 
we find mountains of dinosaur bones in certain places. This one's in China. And notice how they're disarticulated, like maybe they got picked up by water and swirled all around in the violent uh, seas and dumped into a certain spot, maybe in the bottom of a whirlpool or something. Who knows? And this is Dinosaur National Monument in the United States up in the corner of Utah and uh, Colorado, the northern side of that. And in there we, once again, have all kinds of dinosaur fossils stacked up in a mountain <laughs> of sedimentary rock. And so, you know, it's hard to deny that there were dinosaurs on the earth because we see just evidence. And this is a stegosaurus back plate, so we, we find these things and we start piecing them together. Even though they're disarticulated, in certain places we'll find more of a whole dinosaur, so we can start picking art out the pieces of those other ones that are all jumbled together. And so that's, that's the back plate, and that's the tail spike. And that's big, and that would hurt. I'll show you the whole stegosaurus in a minute. But how do we know about the skin? Well, that's fossilized dinosaur skin. And so we can see that it's just like a big lizard, isn't it? Which is exactly what dinosaur means, terrible lizard. And this is dinosaur skin that's mummified. It's not fossilized. Wow, 65 million year old dinosaur skin. The, they have gotten DNA from dinosaurs. Yeah, I've actually got a, something I'm going to cite on that in just a little little bit so that you, you can see what they do with that evidence. <laughs> and so eventually they get enough bones that they can make, you know, a, a drawing of it. And eventually they, they think that they've got it refined pretty well. Then they'll make a model and put it into the museum. This is the Creation Museum. That's the stegosaurus, and you're just too close to it to see the whole thing, so I had to back off and go around the other side and take that picture. But I want you to notice the other dinosaurs. We get all hung up on the big ones. They're not all big. Matter of fact, the average size is, is like maybe a, a, a cow or a buffalo, something like that. And so those other ones, that, that one of those uh, is actually a velociraptor, which is kind of a famous one, and the other one's called Heterodinosaurus. I'll show you them again in a minute. But they're knee high. They're long from front to head to toe, but they're knee high. They're not huge. So not all the dinosaurs are huge. A lot of people don't realize that. So they, they find bones, and, and depending on the bones that they find, they'll make models. So I'm surmising that this one they found a bunch of neck vertebrae, so they gave it a really long neck. That's, otherwise, I don't know why they would do that. Hopefully they're following the evidence and not making stuff up. So when you go in the Creation Museum, this is the first thing you see after you get through the lobby. And it's a evolutionist with the dark hair and the creationist with no hair. <laughs> and, and they're playing over the loud, over the intercom, the speakers, what they're each thinking. They're digging up the same evidence once again. They're looking at the same thing, but they're interpreting it from their two different worldviews. So the evolutionist, once again, he thinks that it's millions of years old. And the creation is saying, wow, probably 4,400 years old, buried in the flood, and so on. And, and so wouldn't you just love to ask that evolutionist, how does a whole dinosaur get buried in one little millimeter at a time? How do you bury and fossilize a whole dinosaur? It had to be something really rapid and catastrophic happened to do that, which points right to one of the worldviews being right. And it's not the one the evolutionist wants to hear. So let's use the Bible to explain dinosaurs. And the first thing about dinosaurs is it's not in the King James Version of the Bible. It doesn't say dinosaurs in there anywhere. It'd be really hard since the word wasn't invented until 1841 and the King James Bible was, was uh, translated in 1611. So there's a 230-year gap there that uh, you can't you know, come up with the word dinosaur when it's 230 years from being invented. So the word dinosaur isn't in the Bible, so we'll, co we'll cover other things that could be dinosaurs. It, interestingly, dinosaur is a new word because it wasn't even in the 1828 dictionary, even though computer and locomotive and rocket were. 
dinosaur wasn't there. It wasn't invented until 1841. So I'm going to teach you five F's tonight for dinosaur history. This is an answers in Genesis thing. You can probably find this on their website if you want to go back and review this at some point. But the beasts of the earth were created on day six. And we also know that on day six, man was created. So according to the Bible, the dinosaurs and man did live together. And T. rex is a land animal and it was created on day six. So he was in the garden, but it was okay because they ate vegetation until Adam and Eve sinned. They also did not eat meat until after the fall. Well, I do have, this is right when you walk in the lobby at the Creation Museum. I, I don't know if they just put it there to offend the evolutionists or what, but um, because Adam and Eve didn't have kids at least recorded in the Bible until after the fall, um, the, the dinosaurs could have been evil then, but apparently this one wasn't because the kids got a smile for not being attacked. So, but anyway, humans and dinosaurs did coexist because those T-Rexes used those great big old huge sharp teeth to eat. Ah, melons, yeah. Does it, you know, we got lots of animals that have sharp teeth that aren't meat eaters, even today. So things were very good. At the end of that sixth day, Genesis 131, God pronounced everything very good. So they were formed on day six. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, it affected all of creation, not just the, them. It created all, affected all of creation. And now uh, the animals started attacking each other, maybe even the eating each other. Uh, it's a whole different world. Suddenly, it's a whole different world. And so they were formed on day six. They are a victim of the fall, just like everything else in the world was. And things got so evil that God had to send the judgment. The judgment was the flood. And so this is one of the big objections that people bring up about dinosaurs and humans is, wow, was there really a worldwide flood? And if there was, how'd they get the dinosaurs on there? So we're going to cover that. Okay, the first thing I want you to know, this is in uh, the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, uh, 40 miles from the, 40 minutes by freeway from the Creation Museum. It says, this, that's notice of serpent, okay? If I can convince you that the flood was not real, then I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. So it's kind of going back to that quote I had from Jesus and John that if you don't believe Moses' writing then why would you believe Jesus what, what he said so uh, th this is not a quote from the Bible or anything but I, I think that's exactly what Satan thinks so there it is there's an accurate rendering of the ark yay it's so nice and happy they're so happy looking out there at billions of dead things floating around in the water no, this is not a good depiction. It, as a matter of fact, I, I want you to go back in your church library and see what your arcs look like in your church library. <laughs> because uh, if, if they see this, you need to show them the real thing. Okay, You, you just got to balance it out. Because if you don't, we end up with this. When they get older, dinosaurs in the ark? No way. Couldn't happen. That little toy ark. Can't get dinosaurs in there. And if they watch TV, they may see something like the History Channel that I saw one time. It was called uh, The History of Noah's Ark. And I said, okay, I'm going to watch it as long as I can stand it. So I turned it on, and Noah was running around. It was already raining, and he was kept capturing animals and dragging them on the ark. They forgot to read the account in Genesis before they did their history and so Noah didn't go get them. They came to the ark, two by two, seven of the queen. So this is the ark encounter, just to give you an idea. It's huge. There you can see the people, three stories tall. Inside, 
they had to make ramps for wheelchairs and everything, so I took away some of the space. But it's still huge. There's still all kinds of stuff there that, that uh, you see it's just easily, I mean, when we find out how many dinosaurs had to go on there, no problem. And this is one of their displays there on the ark. It says everything fits, and it tells you about the water, the food, uh, rain capture. It, it, it talks about all the different things, how many uh, animals had to be on there. Or is it on a, a different display, or is it this one? Yeah, it's on, it's on another one. But, um, oh, 1,398 animal kinds, okay? So I think it came out somewhere around 6,000 animals they had to get on the ark on that huge vessel, no problem. So they show you how they stored the water, and the food, all the different things are there on the Ark Encounter. If you ever get a chance to go there, if you're in uh, northern Kentucky, go there. <laughs> and they show the dinosaurs on there. Now these dinosaurs don't exactly look like dinosaurs we have today because we know that there is adaptation and natural selection after they got off the ark. They, they would have been in a new environment, and so they would have perhaps changed through those processes that are real. They are observed. We do see them, and then we know that those are real. So we're the largest animals on the ark. Okay? We think not scriptural. Just using common sense, what we think God would do. He would send juveniles, dinosaurs, because they're not full grown. They take up less space. They eat less. They create less waste. They're often easier to manage. So chances are they didn't bring in the full grown brachiosaurus. Okay? They just brought in a juvenile. And I, I think it's... That very last one there doesn't say it got wiped out somehow. I didn't notice that. That they can also reproduce longer. After they get off the ark, they gotta, they're the only two of their kind. They have to reproduce to keep that kind going. So this guy asks, how could Noah have possibly fit dinosaurs in the ark? And he says, how was it possible for your mother to give birth to you? <laughs> so even the largest full-grown creatures were once small. They didn't have to, ta have to take them full grown. But they accepted whichever ones God sent. I, I think it's significant to know that God sent them because God sent the ones that were genetically pure, had the best chance of surviving. Uh, they weren't the ones that had fallen into carnivory, obviously, or they'd be eating their other animals on the ark. And so God sent the, the ones that he wanted to, the, the, the best ones for after the flood. In my opinion, that's not scriptural. That's my opinion. So there, there they are. There's the dreaded velociraptors. And, and don't get me wrong, they would kill you <laughs> real fast. But the, they're about six feet or seven feet from head to tail, but only uh, between knee and waist high. And that's the heterodontosaurus, about the same size. This is a, a medium or a, an average sized dinosaur. He's sitting up on a platform. This is the one when you go into the room, he kind of looks at you and his eyes glow red and he makes the sound like, I'm eating you for much. The, this one, has anybody ever been to uh, the Jesus of the Ozarks? Okay, uh, they have a creation museum right next to him. I, I went in there, I thought it was gonna be a, an evolutionary one, but no, it wasn't, it was creationist. This was in there, that's another medium sized dinosaur fossil. Now, I've heard people say that they got the dinosaurs on the ark by taking their eggs on the ark. Well, that's not scriptural because they walked to the ark and the, Noah put them on the ark. And it's also hard to tell the pink ones from the blue ones when they're in the eggs. Okay? And you've got to have one of each or you're in trouble. So that's a T-Rex footprint and a T-Rex tooth. And so we take all of our evidence of T-Rexes and we make our model of the T-Rex and he could swallow me in one swallow. Cash would just be an hors d'oeuvre. 
But the, the notice the one behind him. That's more of an average size one. So when I did this, by the way, you, you notice I copy slides from other people. I'm not a professional slide maker at all. I didn't even want to do computers, that, but they made me do it at the end of my teaching career. And uh, so I'm thankful they did because I can at least do a little bit of slide, you know, PowerPoint stuff here. So this is the answer to Genesis slide, about 50 dinosaur cries. I've heard as high as 70, but guess what? That's still only 140 dinosaurs, no problem. And here's something that's valuable to know. The, the Genesis talks about everything reproducing after their own kind. And in the fossil record, that's what we actually see. The gray areas of this diagram are hypothesized links. Well, notice that the ancestral archosaurs have never been found. They're hypothesized. And then as you go up, we don't see the tree. And if it did, it would be an orchard. It wouldn't be one tree with all the different kinds of life. It would be maybe a little bit different uh, dog or whatever. This one's dinosaurs. But uh, we do have uh, differences that pop up through adaptation, natural selection. But... Crocodiles have always been crocodiles, and on across here, uh, all the dinosaurs that we've never seen one become another, one kind become another kind. All of that is hy hypothetical. To believe in evolution, you got to have faith that those gray lines are somewhat accurate. You've Got to have a lot of faith. So, one of the things I want you to notice here is that birds and dinosaurs have coexisted even in the fossil record, as the some evolutionists, not all, believe that dinosaurs became birds. Got to have a lot more going on besides just feathers, by the way, that they tried to put on that National Geographic. It's got to have a different respiratory system, circulatory system, uh, probably a reproductive system. Everything's got to change. You can't just change one little thing, give it feathers and expect it to be flying around as a bird. It's not going to work. It's, it's ridiculous. It's highly ridiculous to even think that could be possible. So there's a, the rest of the dinosaurs that weren't on the ark, they were victims of the flood. And the ones that made it through got their t-shirt. I survived the flood. Oh, but wait. Things weren't the same after the flood. <coughs> Matter of fact, a lot of the dinosaurs uh, we, we see in the pre-flood are in the flood layers that were killed eating vegetation before the flood, it was gymnosperms, it was not leafy trees, it was more the needle trees. And so afterwards, we got more of the deciduous type broadleaf trees. And so they may have a hard time, you know, dinosaurs, some of them just had walnut sized brains, they weren't the brightest creatures around, so they probably had a hard time adapting. And the food was different. So have you ever tried to live for a month off of cotton candy? We'd probably be dead too. We'd have that big belly because we ate all that cotton candy, but we didn't get the nutrients we needed, so we would die. Same thing with the dinosaurs. Could have happened. Once again, this is in the past. We don't know what happened. Of course, the asteroid theory could have validity. I'll talk about that in a minute. And we do believe in an ice age, an ice age. And that could have affected the dinosaurs also. Okay, but I'm going to stop for a minute here. I'm going to talk about the creationist view of the ice age. Because the evolutionists have, the last I saw, 60-something uh, theories on the ice age, and the creationists had like over 20. <laughs> so this is the best one I've ever read, Michael Ord. You can find him on AnswersToGenesis.org or, or ICR.org. And he developed uh, a post-flood ice age that is being presented. And you can find much more information there. But he said it was caused by two main factors. Number one, the water temperature was raised, and that caused evaporation to increase tremendously, meaning you got a lot more uh, moisture in the air. And then the breaking of the great deep caused tectonic activity of epic proportions 
produce huge amounts of volcanic activity, which went up into the atmosphere and spread all over the Earth. And he thinks that that's enough to explain uh, later on we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, there's a possibility that a meteorite or multiple meteorites contributed to this iridium-rich layer, now called the KP layer, I found out yesterday, I didn't have time to change it, of chemical residue found all around the Earth, but that's not part of his theory. But uh, there's a, some theories out there that say the meteorites caused the fountains of the Great Deep to break up. Could have happened. We weren't there. Don't know. But his theory just uses the volcanic activity and says that's su sufficient. We do know that's the two sources of iridium, which is found in this layer. So <clears throat> wind currents carry the residue all around the Earth. As time goes on, it falls to the Earth, forming a thin layer. But the evolutionists say it represents 500,000 years. But uh, it is the presence of this layer that shows that either great volcanic activity took place or a meteorite struck. Only the young Earth view can account for all three of these possibilities. The old age dating puts the KT layer 300,000 years before the mass extinction. Young Earth creationists believe that the flood laid down the layers quickly. Since the KT layer is found in flood sediments, we think it was formed during the year of the flood and recession of the flood waters. No matter what the layer was formed by, we know it was formed at the time of the flood because it's in the flood layer. So it's now KP layer. And you can look it up later. I can't even remember what the P stands for right now. So it stands for the boundary between the Cretaceous rock and tertiary. K was used because uh, we also have Cambrian and they didn't want to confuse the two. So this uh, enrich iridium enrichment layer spreads out over 500 million years according to the evolutionists. So how did it hang in the air for 500 million years? First of all, that's kind of weird. So it would have to be many meteorite impacts to produce iridium over that amount of time. There's never been a correlation found between periods of high iridium concentration with periods of extinction. So this would lead to the deduction that prolonged volcanic activity is the most likely source of this layer and that it, it could only play a secondary role in extinction. Light sensitive organisms in the ocean survived this time period. So, you know, algae survived it. Their numbers decreased for a while, but they came back. They, it didn't make them go extinct. So why would it make the dinosaurs go extinct? They couldn't have lived very long without the light they needed to do photosynthesis. So Michael Ord says that the Ice Age lasted about 700 years in his estimation. The glaciers expanded and receded because of the volcanic activity increasing and decreasing. And they have found 68 volcanic ash falls in the western United States. That would only be enough volcanic activity if you have the young earth view. That, that wouldn't last for hundreds of thousands of years, but for 700 years it could. And the Ice Age had little effect on humans because they just didn't live in the places where the ice would be formed at that time. So this is a climatic deduction. Once again, looking at the past, de deducting from uh, the evidence we do see and the scripture, what might have happened. And this would have contributed to a rather hostile environment after the flood. This hostile environment could have contributed to the alleged extinction of the dinosaurs. Did I say alleged? That means maybe there's still some around. Wow, what do I mean by that? Well, after the flood, they got off the ark. And over time, the dinosaurs didn't do so well. And it, generation after generation it became fewer and fewer until finally we just have that last one, the green one, that looks like what we would, might call a dragon. So the question is, do we have anything on Earth to show evidence for something like a dragon existing? And the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> In European history, Sir George wanted to save the king's daughter. So he went and he, to slay the dragon. One account I said said he captured the dragon. I don't know, uh, but it's in the European history books. And th this was uh, 600 years ago or so, somewhere around there. And so that all over Europe, they have these depictions of that dragon that he slayed. This is the flag of Wales. It's got a little artistic expression there, but 
uh, the basic form you can recognize being kind of the same as that dragon. The masthead of a Viking ship. Now, the zodiac, we Christians don't go there, but for the evidence for this talk tonight, notice that all those animals are real. And the dragon is one of their big years, right? That they love to celebrate the year of the dragon. I think they thought it was a real animal, and there's lots of evidence of that, as we'll see later. So in the Bible, we have this thing called Leviathan. And, oh no, in order to breathe, believe in the literal reading of the Bible, i got to believe that it breathes fire. Oh, well, that's not hard to believe, actually, when, when you just look around God's creation and you see this little bitty beetle that is able to fire out this noxious chemical that, and, and it sounds like a snap cap exploding. He can aim it. He can scare away big predators that would otherwise eat him. And he can protect himself by using this uh, very hot, noxious chemical. He's got two storage chambers in his back end. And he adds a catalyst just as it's going out of the body so it doesn't explode him. Wow, how'd that evolve? Hmm. Two different chemicals need a catalyst. A catalyst that just as they're leaving the beetle so it doesn't wreck the beetle. Hmm. I don't think it could have. Well, another one is behemoth. So here's a kid, he's reading about the behemoth, which he which God made with you, he said, in Job. And he, he just grasped as an ox, and his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. And he moves his tail like a cedar. And the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. So it's a very strong creature. And you can see what he's imagining, the tail like a cedar. Because cedars in the Bible are huge trees. The cedars of Lebanon are especially renowned in Scripture. And so he's imagining that. And then he looks at the footnotes in the Schofield Reference Bible, a couple of other places that were written before they knew about dinosaurs. Matthew Henry, my, one of my favorite commentators, had the same thing. That he didn't know about dinosaurs, so those are the biggest animals they knew about. And they said it was possibly one of those, the elephant or the hippopotamus. And so he tries to imagine the elephant and the hippopotamus with a tail like a cedar. So just in case you didn't know, there's the cedar, a big cedar. And there's the tail of an elephant. God has a sense of humor. And there's the tail of a hippopotamus. That's preposterous. So we can see it's not them. But we can't, you know, those early commentators didn't know about dinosaurs. They didn't have any other candidates at that time. So here's some scriptures. Be careful when you get towards Revelation. The dragon, be, is Satan in some scriptures. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample underfoot. That's talking about an animal. And he shall slay the dragon that's in the sea. And he swallowed me up like a dragon. Must be big. Swallowed me up like a dragon. So in scripture we see where they talked about dragons as real animals. Well, in the 1800s, until now we've been digging up fossils, and uh, especially the later 1800s. And we find that there's dinosaur fossils all over the world buried in rock layers, laid down by water, all over the earth, kind of like there's a worldwide flood. But we, we find them. The communication now is getting good enough that they are communicating and finding out these are all over the world. And people's interest is peaking up until present day. By the way, that's Buddy Davis. He's the one who does did for years the dinosaur sculpting at the Creation Museum. But this is a cast of a fossil of a dinosaur. You can't have real fossils on display because they're fragile and they'll disintegrate if you don't keep them in protected environments. But this is a cast. And the reason I showed you this one is because it, it has a structure that in its head similar to the structure in the back end of the beetle. It's got a couple chambers 
by in another chamber in the nasal cavity that's bigger than normal. And it's a candidate for what could have been perhaps a dragon. Am I saying that was a dragon? I can't say it's a dragon. I didn't see it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there, there are animals out there that could have been dragons. You can't just write it off as a fairy tale. So we find all these different fossils out there. What is that? You know what that is, Cash? It's a triceratops, huh? Yeah, I knew you knew that. Okay, and there's the T-Rex. So we, we find them, and then we find their skin, and we put the model together, and then we find skeletons of these pteranodons, which did not have feathers. They were more like bat wings. And we make models of them, and then we go into caves in Utah, and we find depictions like this. And the feet, notice the web feet, so they, people discounted those web feet. We found evidence of that in some fossils that they did have, indeed have web feet. So this is more than likely something that they saw in that southern area of Utah. And the indigenous people in that area, uh, the, the old timers, I can't remember what they call them, uh, the ancients, said that they did see these in their lifetime, but we haven't ever found uh, real credible evidence of that. So evidence of the Bible's account of dinosaur history. This is in the Creation Museum. So let's look at some cool stuff here. This is from South America. This is, once again, 15, 1600. That looks like a T-Rex. See, I wonder where they saw that T-Rex book to get that out of. Or maybe they lived with the T-Rex. It looks like this particular culture had some conflicts, <laughs> as you'll see. The next one, there's a long-necked dinosaur that's got another guy by the leg. And this particular Ica culture had all kinds of this kind of pottery. This must be their hero. He's got two of them at once. He's battling two at once. They're smaller ones, though. So uh, this could be folklore depicted on the pottery. But whether it is or not, they actually saw the T-Rexes. They didn't just make that up. And then you see something like this where they have all those, and you're going, whoa, I think they saw them. Another South American culture in Peru, I believe this one's from. The top right-hand one is the best, easiest to see one. And their pottery also have these things on it. And some of them are even in 3D on their pottery. So how did these ancient people know what these dinosaurs look like? Well, I don't think they had books that they were taking around showing, giving their kids about the dinosaurs and stuff. I think that they were actually living with the dinosaurs. That's, that's pretty reasonable to, to think, I think. I think. Oh, that's Sir George again. Now, in China, in Thailand, they have a huge dragon, or big in their culture. And so in the year of the dragon, of course, they're dragging all these depictions around. But this one's real uh, interesting. This one's about 2,000 years old, and it's an accurately uh, done, including correct posture, dermal spines, and forearms of the Therizinosaur. 2,000 years ago in the Chinese culture. And this is in Thailand. And they found that when they found this village had been overrun by the rainforest and they uh, started cutting back the vegetation and everything, and they found that there. Probably a type of stegosaurus. And this is from Egypt, and it's a mosaic. But... The people are hunting the dinosaur. Well, after the flood, God told people that they could eat meat now. And so they are, might be hunting it for protection, and they might have a feast because that would provide a lot of meat. So that's another one that shows what could have happened to the dinosaurs. They could have been hunted the ones that were left. 
and here's one in the southwestern United States. Shows a couple long neck dinosaurs out there with the cattle and everything, <laughs> and the Indians hunting them. And I don't blame them because, man, those dinosaur legs are so good. Tastes just like frog legs. No, no, but photoshopping is nice, isn't it? Well, here's another depiction from the Chinese culture that is a very common looking thing in their art and uh, everything. And this is a drawing done by Marco Polo. This is from a sketch of his showing two stegosaurus like dinosaurs pulling his cart. This is brass carvings of dinosaurs in the tomb of Bishop Bell in the 15th century in England. And my understanding is that they keep a rug over this so nobody will see it. Because that's evidence for long neck dinosaurs in the 1400s still being around where people could see them. And this is a iguanodon. Richard Owens is the guy who, who coined the term dinosaur, by the way, terrible lizard. And so he, he made a... Uh, rudimentary, you know, that's what the fossils they have at the time. They found more fossils. They updated their idea of what the iguanodon looked like. And now we think that as they got heavier that they went down on all fours, but that most of the weight was still on the back. But uh, the young ones were just bipedal and the adults were on all fours. Well, we find this is also about 2,000 years old and it's an accurately chiseled and there we go. Yeah, we put a harness on that one. I actually saw this in one of the South American cultures on one of the websites I'll show you later. That they had a drawing of, the, of a similar thing like this in a whole different part of the world. So perhaps there's some truth to it. I, I just thought it was, you know, fanciful thinking, but who knows? So. There's another one around the time of Christ, these two. And then we have the Utah cave drawings. The Kachina Bridge, this is near the Kachina Bridge in Arches National Monument. And looks like a long neck dinosaur. <coughs> So you remember where Dinosaur National Monument is, Utah and Colorado? And uh, seems like maybe some of those dinosaurs that they lived with got picked up and washed into that area in the flood, who knows? But some of them survived and they saw them. This is in Lake Champlain in the eastern part of the United States. Looks kind of like a stegosaurus except it's got horns. So maybe it's something we've never found a fossil of. I don't know. So here's a conclusion, not of the talk, but of what I, the evidence I just showed you. Many cultures from all over the earth accurately show dinosaurs in their art and pottery long before dinosaur fossils were identified and the modern day models were formed. It appears that these people lived with the dinosaurs. I, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. How did they all get the same type of creatures back then? Living oceans apart from each other. Well, we still got more evidence. This has been around for a while now. How many of you have seen this before? Uh, Mary Schweitzer's soft dinosaur tissue. Okay, a few, but not everybody. That's, I'm glad I want you to see this because this was a, a T-Rex femur that she was trying to hurry and get to the lab one night and it broke in half. And when she looked inside of it, she saw this soft, flexible, stretchy material. And then when she got into the lab, I mean, that, that white material there uh, on the left-hand side, you could actually pull it and it'll go back. It's supposed to be 65 million years that it was buried. And as she went to the laboratory and looked at the soft tissue, she, she found red blood cells. They raked her over the coal, said, those aren't red blood cells. They can't be red blood cells. She ran it through all the tests. They were red blood cells in a T-Rex femur. 
And this is, to date, uh, the most best preserved dinosaur tissue to date. That's not fossilized. That's actual dinosaur mummified tissue of a megalopter. Yes. Well, I'm going to give you a few examples of suppressed evidence. Why haven't we heard about this? You might ask yourself. I'm going to start with a guy named Mark Armitage, who uh, we in Arizona in the creation science community know that he's one of the leading electron microscopists in the world, and he's found many amazing things. But one of the things he found when he was working for Cal State Northridge was a triceratops horn with soft tissue. And he took it back and he took photographs of it and he reported his results. And he was promptly fired from his job at Cal State. All of a sudden, they didn't have funding for him anymore. And during this process, one of the university officials, I think from the science department, yelled at him, we are not going to tolerate your religion in this department. Doesn't matter what the scientific evidence says, your religion doesn't belong here. Even if that's where the science takes us, it's not allowed. That's why you haven't heard of stuff like this. And in 1994, the winners of the race to sequence dinosaur DNA were Scott Woodward and his colleagues. They published the results in the journal Science. They extracted DNA. We were talking about that earlier. Yes, they can get DNA from purportedly well-preserved dinosaur bone. I guess so. They got DNA from it. And they were not rewarded for their victory. The sequence they discovered was not like birds or reptiles, which it was supposed to be, right? For the, for the dinosaurs to become birds. But it, it seemed unique, like it was its own kind. Since this 1994 DNA did not fit the interpretive filter of the evolutionists, they raked this team over their academic coals so violently, harshly, that no scientist has attempted to publish any dinosaur DNA research since then. This was published in 2009. 15 years, they squashed it. But we're finding more and more soft tissue in dinosaur bones. <laughs> and the bones or the the actual bones? Yes. Bones, the but the inside, the inside was not fossilized, but the outside was. Is that what the you mean? The outside was made of rock? Yeah. She was picking it up. She thought she had a femur uh, of a T-Rex, but it broke in half. And it, only then did she discover what was inside, because typically they wouldn't take a part of valuable fossil like that yeah but but then she found this you know that one picture looked like meat didn't it i mean just fresh so uh, how much liquid was actually there i don't know i can't answer that specifically well if a cow dies on the range they shut the lab too you're right stuff yeah rapidly, rapidly. exactly <laughs> they'll get picked apart scattered yep so we got that going on. I, I, didn't, I just thought of this in the shower before I came. In my 10 reasons to doubt radiometric dating uh, presentation, I have a slide where this team carbon dated dinosaur bones, which evolutionists don't do. It's millions of years old. There's no carbon-14 in it. So they don't date it. Well, these guys said, well, let's do it. They did it. The bones all dated from 22 to 39,000 years old. They presented it at a peer review conference. And right after the conference, you, you go there and you see every presentation that was given, except for one. Guess which one they took off? Oh, this doesn't fit the criteria we want. So they take it off. This is suppressed. You probably. Many of you probably not heard of the rate project where they found carbon-14 in one to two billion years old diamonds in every one of them that they tested. So that's another whole presentation that, uh, but just to tell you, this stuff is going on. You will not see things that don't fit the evolutionary dogma in, in the, before the public eye. You got to search for it if you want to know what's going on. So. Uh, dinosaur sightings, are they still alive today? And we don't really know, because in order to prove that they don't exist today, 
you have to be everywhere at once at the same time, right? So we don't really know. We don't know of any uh, concrete examples, but this was one I'd heard about before. So I researched it on the ICR.org site, and it talks about Mokeli Mabimbe, which is a, supposed to be in the swamp, in, in kind of, be, I think, between Kenya and uh, Uganda. And it's large, it's as big as the state of Arkansas, I understand. It's huge. It has a rainy season where nobody goes in there. It has a drier season where missionaries would go in, try to reach the indigenous people. And the missionaries came out and said, yeah, we saw it. You know, it's, it's real. There's a long neck dinosaur in there. So they actually sent uh, creationist scientific research teams in there. Didn't see it. Recorded some weird sound. So that sounds like the Bigfoot thing to me. So I, I say, until there's credible evidence, we must treat these stories uh, like we would the legend of Bigfoot. we got to see credible evidence, not hearsay. But I will tell you this. This is indirect, but they took a modern-day dinosaur book around to the different people. Not everybody called it Mokeli Mbembe. They didn't all speak the same language. They went around to the different people, and they all pointed to the same one in the book that they'd seen. So that's indirect evidence. And this missionary <laughs> uh, and his wife said that they saw a creature like this, but with bigger dermal spines and... Uh, that's, that's it in Africa. That's, that's the place I was talking about, if you see the map there. And this one is in South America along the Ukulele River Valley. And this colonel said that he saw what he thought was Diplodocus. And it's confirmed by many of the tribes east of the Ukulele. So, you know, we do have people saying that they've seen these things, but, you know, in today's modern day, era we should have some pictures of some sort everybody's got their phone in their pocket at all times and so something should be turning up but it hasn't but let's consider these you know dinosaurs are terrible lizards croc monitors 10 to 12 feet long that's pretty big remember they're about the size of a cow or a buffalo that's a average size dinosaur so an iguana would be like an average size dinosaur Komodo dragon, <laughs> up to 10 feet long, these baby elephants. Alligator, up to 16 feet. Saltwater croc, up to 23 feet. We still got some big things on the earth today. Well, it, there's definitely some differences between them and the dinosaurs we find in the fossil record, though. So this is the dinosaur they have in the Creation Museum. Notice how his feet are underneath him, his belly's up off the ground. And he's got that frilly thing on his back. Okay. So I came home from my trip in 2010 and we went, took a trip to the Phoenix Zoo. And I saw a Komodo dragon. And I looked at that and I went, wait a minute. Boy, do those look similar. Take away the frill. And then notice his legs are like the things today spread out. So did he lose information for the frill? That's possible. You can lose information. You just can't gain information. And uh, maybe just an adaptation could have spread him out. I'd love to see a DNA study. But, uh, of course, the people, a lot, a lot of the people online say this couldn't possibly be true, but I'd love to see the study. And this is called a Gaia. It was also in the Phoenix Zoo then, but I haven't seen it since. But it's big. So in Colossians 2.8, it says, Beware lest any man cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. That's all the secular dinosaur view right there. Philosophy, deceit, tradition of men, basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So what do we know? It's a demonic thing. It's a demonic lie. That's what we know. Because it's not according to Christ. If it's not according to Christ, then it comes from the other realm. So we need to make dinosaurs our missionary lizards. We need to get materials into our church libraries that tell people about it. Is Genesis really history would help the adults and those kids' answers books would help the kids and, and DVDs too. And, and uh, 
There's lots of stuff. You go online and you can find lots of stuff. So the creation ministry is exciting. I've seen dinosaur tracks, T-R-A-C-T-S, used to lead people to Christ. I didn't bring any tonight. Usually I have bring a whole bunch of my what really happened to the dinosaurs uh, little booklet from Answers in Genesis. And this is the most popular gospel tract I've ever had. People see the dinosaurs on there. I used to hand them out at the trunk or treat on Main Street when, the, when they used to have it there. People go by, hundreds of people. I just put those out on the table. Oh, can I have one of those? You bet. Take two. Give them to your friends. And they got the gospel in the back of them along with the real history of dinosaurs. So that you can get those from Answers in Genesis if you want to. Um, you get a, a hundred at a time at 29 cents each. Really reasonable. So in summary, the ideas presented in any dinosaur talk, of which Pastor Joe will be talking about tomorrow over at Ponderosa, uh, they should agree with God's word. That's the one thing we're going to have in common is that it's going to agree with God's word. And uh, there should be some other things in common too, but there may be some different ideas. But as long as we're using God's word as our basis, uh, we're on solid ground. Behemoth, Leviathan, and, and the dragons are possible dinos. As long as you're not looking at the dragon, that's Satan. We're talking about the actual animal dragon mentioned in scripture. There are many cultures from around the world that show man and dinos live together. Soft tissue and blood cells were found in dinosaur bones. Couldn't have lasted 65 million years. The evolutionists are still trying to explain that. They're coming up with different theories, but you can go online and read the rebuttals to the rebuttal to the rebuttal. It's all there. And there was plenty of room on the ark for all the animals, dinosaurs included. No problem getting them all on there. Well, I'm going to leave this one up here. If anybody just wants to see some sites where you can do some more research on your own, get more information. Uh, I will tell you this. I, I went on Google Images and typed in dinosaurs and man. Saw one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen. It had Ken Ham laying on the ground. Looked like a real Ken Ham with his gut spilled out and a velociraptor eating his gut. Just a warning that the demonic is not, <laughs> is everywhere and you gotta watch it. So if your kids are doing that, you know what, you might just wanna be sure you're uh, there to get rid of that real fast or whatever. So, but these are the ones that have evidence that supports the young earth uh, creationist view of the dinosaurs. I would recommend if you want to go there. And I guess it's time for questions. Is that correct, Michael? Is that what we're doing now? Yes, Mr. Stafford, and turn around the wonderful world of liquor. <laughs>